watch it glitches. So I have managed to complete version 1.5 of a conceptual architecture for a tokenized economy with programmable banking, programmable money, and the capital flux capacitor. So you may be asking, what is a capital flux capacitor? Well, capital flux is another way of saying liquidity and a capacitor is a pool. So AKA deep pools of public liquidity. So what I wanna do here is go over this completed diagram, the conceptual architecture for tokenizing real world assets and um, drop in, I think one of the things that has been missed, which is programmable money, which is something that I'll be working on in the near future. So um, there are other videos that where I've described elements of this diagram before, but let's recap everything briefly because it's, it has been a while. So up here in the top kind of left-hand corner of this diagram, we have Ripple and its customers. So for people that don't know, um, Ripple is basically enterprise uh, software uh, service provider, and it's decided to move into the digital asset space. And they have essentially a number of products that can bridge TradFi and DeFi. And these are standard enterprise products, potentially installed on-prem or consumed software as a service. And uh, let's jump into a couple of the more uh, famous products. So R Ripple ODL is now Ripple Pay. It's essentially ODL was on-demand liquidity. And it, I've dropped in diagrams directly from Ripple's website here that describe the process by which cross-border um, transactions are settled using Ripple Net, Ripple Pay, ODL, XRP or some combination of those. And I think the important thing to take away here is that um, Ripple Pay and Liquidity Hub, Liquidity Hub provides like turnkey platform, turnkey solutions for businesses. So recent ac acquisitions such as Metaco and the, um, the other custodial service provider really give Ripple the ability to transfer value, convert value, and store value in the form of digital assets. So it's an end-to-end solution for enterprises, giving them access to um, essentially institutional DeFi and, uh, and other digital asset services in a way that they're uh, used to consuming, whether it's software as a service or software deployments on their own on-prem or cloud infrastructure. So I don't want to spend a huge amount of time on this. Suffice to say that they are bringing the world um, in terms of centralized exchanges, decentralized exchanges, wallets, um, other service providers like Fireblocks, which is, this, which is a digital asset custodian, Copper, Bitstamp, is a centralized exchange, so on and so forth. They're bringing all of those services together and making them available to their customers. Their customers primarily being you know, payments institutions, smaller banks, some of the larger banks, and some central banks as well. Um, so those are the architectural components there. Then really importantly, we have the XRPL, the XRP ledger. And I've tried to capture here um, the various components of the XRPL. It's not an exhaustive list, but and also on the side of this diagram, kind of go into details again about each element of the XRPL. There's plenty of information on the XRPL, so I'm not gonna go over that here. You can also look at my previous video. The important thing which we didn't get today, unfortunately, we didn't get it on Valentine's Day, is the uh, AMM amendment um, going live. So it's gonna take a few more weeks of just patching up a, a couple of bugs in there and, and then we expect the AMMs to go live on the XRPL. And that will allow um, anyone to create a liquidity pool on the XRPL. And the benefits of doing that is that you get exposure to uh, both the decentralized exchange, the oldest decentralized exchange in, uh, in, in the cryptocurrencies on blockchain and also the CLOB. The, the central limit order book. So the combination of these three elements really make uh, or create incentives for liquidity providers to create liquidity pools. And these liquidity pools could be, try to capture them here, 
But if you're a central bank, because we know Ripple has uh, pilots with central banks, you could potentially uh, be in a situation where you issue your central bank digital currency on a private ledger here, maybe send it over to commercial banks or directly create uh, liquidity pools. Um, making a whole wholesale or a retail CBDC available via liquidity pool. Probably retail CBDC, I would imagine, rather than wholesale, because whole, wholesale CBDCs would probably end up going to commercial banks or directly to larger institutions, probably via bank accounts held directly with the central bank or by selected banks that hold those accounts. But in any case, um, other things can be... Um, Add, uh, uh, we can have other types of assets being added as uh, automated market makers, especially in the, in the world of real world asset tokenization. Anyone can issue tokens on the XRPL, just as with other blockchains. And it's worth noting that recently XLS 39D, the clawback amendment was uh, approved and added to the XRPL. This is important because Asset issuers do want the ability to claw back those uh, those tokens, not the XRP itself, because that's the native asset and it's permissionless on a decentralized blockchain. But as a token issuer, I may be obliged by regulations or the law or the jurisdiction in which I'm operating to be able to claw back those tokens, for example, in the case of fraud or money laundering, whatever that may be. So it's an important amendment to have the ability to issue tokens that can be clawed back. Um, anyway, once you've issued these tokens, and who would do that? Well, kind of any business can get involved in issuing tokens. Um, and the kinds of tokens, the kinds of real world assets that could be issued, real estate, collectibles, infrastructure, equities, securities, gaming tokens. You can create all of those kinds of things. Um, on the XRPL and then potentially use them uh, as uh, in, in a in a uh, automated market maker. You can potentially make a liquidity pool. Whether or not you do that really depends on a lot of different factors, but the possibility is there. Um, and the AMM essentially this is what's driving what I what I call ca uh, capital flux uh, capacity because. The AMMs on the XRPL have three forms of returning or generating value for liquidity providers and, and other market participants, for example, arbitrages. So there's volatility harvesting, there's market maker spreads, and there's arbitrage bid fees as well. Again, that's been described in other videos. Check out Mickey B. Fresh's videos on that. He does a fantastic job of going into these in greater detail. And I did a video on this myself as well but this combination here of or this capability of having um, liquidity pools with a dex and a club on a permissionless permissionless decentralized exchange uh, ledger and these participants essentially having in the form of programmable money we see cbdc's and central banks with cbdc's and stable coins um, that's the programmable money aspect of it. In terms of the DeFi aspect of it um, and digital asset aspect of it, it's, as it's asset token, uh, digital asset token issuance and uh, capability to bridge to DeFi. Now that, that's coming, but this is something that I think Flare does incredibly well. So Flare Networks, um, the blockchain for data, connecting everything. Um, they've got a pretty neat technology that's going to be coming on board quite soon called Layer Cake, which is the most advanced form of bridging that I'm aware of. Um, essentially, the key component, I think one of the key components of Layer Cake is uh, the fact that it has uh, insurance capability, where if we look here, there's a bit more information about it where bandwidth providers will actually get kind of slashed if they behave badly, if they kind of try and drain, uh, drain liquidity from the, from the bridge. So it's a very different kind of bridging technology, um, and it's not susceptible to the old forms of DeFi attacks where liquidity is drained by, you know, hacking a door account or something like that. 
um, state connectors kind of monitor the state of different uh, blockchains uh, in a decentralized manner, uh, verifying that assets have been moved from one chain to another, again, in a highly decentralized manner. And if, uh, if there are bad actors, they get slashed and, and punished with the um, participants being refunded in whatever they were trying to bridge. So it's a very good bridging technology there. And this is important. This is important because what we want to do is, is well, certainly what I want to do, and I think what we want to do is to eliminate friction in financial services. And I think this is where I want to start to talk about programmable banking a little bit. So Pave Bank is the world's first fully programmable bank. What does that mean? Well, one way of describing it is uh, allowing Turing complete programming languages to be applied at the account level in CFI for the first time. And that really gives your bank account superpowers because imagine a situation where there is a Pave Bank app store and a community of developers cre creating programmable banking applications, which either wrap APIs or connect to smart contracts and dApps, or do a combination of both to deliver some kind of functionality. Well, what kind of functionality could they be delivering? In the back office, there are a vast number of use cases where, um, financial operations suffer from friction, either due to internal processes, internal technology, or to the sheer number of service providers that are and participants within a financial operation that need to be kept in the loop through integrations and platforms that you've had to build or integrate to yourself within your technology stack. So all of these use cases here suffered to varying degrees of friction with some of the larger ones being liquidity and treasury operations. Imagine you're a large corporation with multiple um, headquarters, with, with multiple entities across multiple jurisdictions, all of which that need to have different currency flows to maintain their budgets, to pay their employees, to buy supplies, to do their marketing or whatever. Treasury and liquidity functions become really complicated very quickly and susceptible to fraud and risk. So um, with a programmable banking app applied to your bank account directly, you can disintermediate or obviate the need to have as many service providers. You can get rid of those commercial um, engagements that you have with multiple suppliers. Instead, you could use a programmable banking app that takes care of all of the underlying integrations and apply it directly to your bank account. And then with a bit of configuration on your site, you can essentially simplify, standardize and automate all of those financial operations. So I think programmable banking sits very much alongside programmable money and digital assets and DeFi. I think it's the missing piece here. And what X algorithmic will be doing, we exist to eliminate friction in the financial sector. That's the reason for X algorithmic. And we'll be, do, we'll be hopefully building the, the world's first programmable banking applications that will be published to the PaveBank app store. Um, hopefully in the next 12 months, if not sooner. And I'm going to start with account attestation um, as a programmable banking application proof of concept that will fuse TradFi and uh, DeFi. And I'm hoping it will do that by being able to take a uh, take the our, our bank balance and on demand publish its value to initially I'm going to use Flare networks. Um, so why why is this useful? Well, today you know you, you need to attest your bank balances for lots of different things. Um, whether it's a letter of credit, whether it's to do operations in another country, there are lots of reasons to attest your bank balance. And also, you know, recently, just for your cre your worthiness and trust for your customers. So, you know, if there's an exchange um, that, uh, like, we've seen a number of crypto exchanges begin attesting to uh, the amount of digital assets that they hold on chain. This is like the CFI equivalent. 
if you hold a paid bank bank account, you can then attest, provide attestation of your bank balance to a blockchain. Why is it useful to put it on a blockchain? Well, other smart contracts and dApps can then consume it. That's why. So it's a it's a very primitive building block for what I think will be um, used in real world asset tokenization. And there's probably a bunch of these very simple primitive building blocks that we can begin building right now, testing right now, that will really eliminate a lot of the friction that currently participants in real world asset tokenization suffer from. So if you wanted to kind of, uh, let's say you got some real estate in Dubai that you wanted to, or UAE that you wanted to tokenize, it's going to cost you a few million to play that game. You're going to have to you know, hire some engineers or go to a platform provider, you're going to have to integrate with a number of systems. You're going to have to get yourself a commercial banking relationship. Now, it would be, and all of that could cost you anywhere between two and 10 million to set up easily. So that's a bit of a barrier to adoption for businesses that really could do something interesting with real world asset tokenization, but because of that cost, that barrier to entry, um, they can't even begin. Well, we can eliminate a lot of that friction with programmable banking. Eventually, I would hope we have a teaming developer community here that is building programmable banking applications that with various kind of fee structures, it, Everything that exists today for apps on any on any store, whether it's licensing, revenue, uh, f fixed fees, um, uh, whatever you can think of, you know, even advertising revenues on some of these uh, programmable banking applications. If we can create that developer community, then we can begin to really eliminate a lot of friction in the financial sector, especially for new participants. So I think this is one way where you know states can begin to create more of a level playing field for new actors to enter into a new economy um, and like some of the use cases that I'm again really interested in when it comes to asset issuance is actually digital capital formation um, if we're going to build a new economy which it seems like we're driving that way so it looks like we have to because the old one's pretty defunct at this stage um, Creating capital, creating and forming digital capital is going to be fundamental to that, just like the rule of law. And this is this can be made a lot easier with programmable banking, essentially. So I think you know, I'm excited to work kind of to use Flare networks because why Flare? And I've been that's been asked a number of times. Well, I think it's because decentralization is in their DNA. Um, I tweeted the other day that the governance structure for Flare Networks is kind of one of the most elegant and sophisticated at the same time that I've seen so far. Um, and that lays the foundation for decentralization. Then if you look at what Flare have managed to do with the FTSO, the FTSOs, the Flare Time Series Oracles, they've managed to solve, uh, again, in, in a pretty elegant fashion, the Oracle problem where um, you know, price data is provided by independent parties and is essentially kind of goes to an algorithm that, that rewards the price providers that provided the most accurate pricing. And they're doing similar things in other areas of DeFi. We, we talked about the state connector, for example. Um, so that's one reason. I think that, um, their stated goal is to be the blockchain for data and and to connect everything. So right now they're providing decentralized data to blockchains and to and I think there's probably a case for providing centralized data as well because you know the bank here is a centralized authority on the uh, balance of an account. So publishing that data to Flare networks to me seems to be like a natural fit and maybe there's a protocol or a pattern that we can follow that will kind of make sure that the, the data that is published comes from 
uh, programmable bank which is associated with a particular bank account, for example, and, and authoritative. So that's something that I'd really like to explore on Flare Networks. The other one is connecting everything, right? Because programmable banking applications, these will sit on the bank's infrastructure, but they and they'll consume kind of events around uh, a bank account. And they will have the capability of connecting to dApps, but also to APIs. And Flare has an API portal, which makes it really easy for Web2 based applications to access uh, Web3, essentially. So these are all the ones that you can very quickly begin to um, integrate with via the Flare API portal. But then if you need to go directly to blockchains, and these are some of the blockchains that I'm interested in when it comes to real world assets and attestation, um, programmable banking applications we use dApps and smart contracts to connect directly to blockchains. Now, once they're connected, if we wanted to shift value from one blockchain to another, what would we use? Well, I would, my preference would be layer cake. I would love to use layer cake to transfer value between these blockchains, because as I said earlier, I think it's the most secure um, method of doing that. So these technologies together, um, these all of these different blockchains, and we live in a, you know, uh, a multipolar blockchain world. Um, I think this could be an architecture for real world asset tokenization moving forward. So as I always say, um, don't predict the future program it. Um, we're nearly at the point where um, I think seed funding is going to be closed hopefully by the end of this month. And I've already talked to some engineers. So I'm quite excited about beginning to build this out. Um, and yeah, it would be great to work directly with Flair on at least some element of this, maybe this bank attestation proof of concept, it would be amazing to get that out onto Flare Network. Thanks a lot, everyone. I'll leave it at that and uh, have a wonderful Valentine's Day.